Before I get into my message here this morning, I just want to offer up a, a little word of prayer. Father God in heaven, Lord, I'm so thankful to be a part of the family of God, that we can come here on Sabbath mornings and get into the word and learn what it is you have for us there this morning. And this morning, Lord, we're going to look at what it means to, again to make an impact and a difference in the lives of those around us. And as we look at this principle laid out by Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would open the word to us. I'm asking that you would anoint my lips, help me speak, teach me what to say. Right now, asking for the gift of preaching. And may everything said and done be to the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name. Amen. Amen. It has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wings can create a hurricane halfway around the world. My message this morning is entitled The Butterfly Effect. How many of you have ever heard of The Butterfly Effect? Anybody here ever heard of that? Well, now, I'm not talking about the movie. I actually want to talk about the science. That term, the butterfly effect, was brought to us by a man known as Edward Lorenz. And Lorenz was a mathematician and a meteorologist who worked at MIT. And he loved to study the weather. But there was this one thing that just always frustrated him. And that was how difficult it can be to predict the weather. Now, you all know the weatherman always gets it right, right? Oh, no, they struggle too. And Lawrence figured out why. And the reason is simple. Nobody can fully predict how the weather in one place is going to impact the weather in another. And what Lawrence noticed is that everything on our planet is so interconnected that a small change over here can result in a huge change over there. And that got him thinking about how everything is so interconnected on our planet. And in 1962, he presented a paper entitled The Butterfly Effect. Now, the theory for the butterfly effect most often sounds like this. A butterfly flaps its wings in China, and it produces a hurricane in Kansas. Can you imagine what you could do with the sneeze? I mean, there goes the pyramids, right? Lawrence kind of thought of it like this. A butterfly subtly flaps its wings, kind of like a whisper on the wind. And those whispers just move the air molecules around it, and they move more molecules, and they move molecules, and they move molecules until you end up with a hurricane halfway around the world. So why am I sharing this with you? Because when I look into the word of God, I too see the butterfly effect. You see, one day God decided that he could change the world through one man, Jesus Christ. So God took Jesus and dropped him into the sea of humanity and the ripple effect, the ripple effect began. And then Jesus decided he could change the world through 12 men. And then 120. And those 120 went out and they changed the lives of 3,000 people. And here we are today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going around the world. And you see, it was Jesus' intent to change the world through the gospel. But now let me share with you just how big that task would really be. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. It's Matthew 24 and it's verse 14. And it's a very famous Bible text. Maybe you studied it in Sabbath school. And it reads, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, you see that word for nations? Jesus wasn't talking about political nations. The United Nations recognizes some 197 countries as political nations, but that's not the word Jesus used. If you're a note taker, you see that word for nations? Well, circle that in your Bible, and you could write beside it this Greek word, ethne, and it means ethnic linguistic groups. In other words, every tongue, tribe, and people. Guess how many ethno-linguistic groups there are on this planet? Thousands is a good direction. There are some 27,000 ethno-linguistic groups on this planet. And Jesus said, we're going to reach every single one of them with the gospel. Amen? Amen? 
But now I want to share with you just how small that beginning would be. Leaving Matthew chapter 24, take your Bibles and go back to Matthew chapter 13. It was our scripture reading today. And I want you to just see how small the beginning of the gospel would be. And we read it here this morning. Dalton, thank you for doing that. It says, here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. Now, the question you've got to ask is this. How small is a mustard seed? Well, if you grew up in Sabbath school or church, you would have been told that a mustard seed is the smallest seed there is. It's one of the smallest in the world. But now here's the thing. If you were to plant this seed in your garden, it would grow to be the size of a small tree. And Jesus said the gospel is going to be like one of these seeds. We're going to plant it. It's going to be small, but its impact is going to be global. Now... Here's the crux of my message today. If you forget everything else, please just remember this. I want you to just remember this one thing. That if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God and help the gospel go to all the world, then all you have to do is be on the team and do your part. Let me say that again. If you want to help grow the kingdom of Jesus Christ, then all you have to do is be on the team and do your part. I'd like to use an illustration from the world of basketball. Anybody here know the name Michael Jordan? Okay, Michael Jordan has to be the most famous, if not the most successful player to ever play the game of basketball. But a person you may not know or even remember is a basketball player by the name of Stacy King. Now, King and Michael Jordan played with the Chicago Bulls back in the day when the Chicago Bulls dominated the game of basketball. One night in 1990, they were playing against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And Michael Jordan was having the game of his life. That night, he scored 69 points. I mean, it was, an, it was a personal best and a career all-time high. Well, towards the end of the game, the coach said, Okay, Michael, you've had enough. I'm going to bench you. And then he sent out rookie Stacy King. And within the last seconds of that game, King gets the ball puts one in the hoop, and he scores two points. And with that, that's the end of the game. Years later, nobody really remembers who Stacy King is. That is until a magazine caught up with him because of the work he was doing with inner city kids and the success he was having. And so the reporter sat him down and they were interviewing him. And of course, they asked Stacy this question. What was the highlight of your basketball career? And without hesitation and without missing a beat, King said, well, it had to be the night that Michael Jordan and I together scored 71 points. <laughs> Don't miss my point. All you have to do is be on the team and do your part. It doesn't matter if you score the 69 points or if you score the two. It all comes together because we're all on Jesus' team. And when one of us wins, we all win. If we baptize somebody in China, we win. We baptize somebody in Toronto, we win. We baptize somebody in South America, we all win because we're all on the team. And all you have to do is do your part. And so this morning, I'd like to share with you three things you can do. If you want to be on the team and you want something to do, then I'd like to suggest the three, things that, three following things that you can do while you're on the team. And they are, you can pray all you can, do all you can, and give all you can. Now, I'd like to start with the first one, and let me explain what it means to pray all you can. Again, in Scripture we read, it's 2 Thessalonians, it's chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. And then there's this from James, and you all know this one, James 5 and 16. The effective prayer of a righteous man or woman can accomplish much. How many of you have ever received a letter 
from a ministry or missionaries, and they were writing to you to ask for help. Those letters basically have four parts. This is who we are. This is what we're doing. Would you please pray for us? And by the way, we could use your support. One year, my family and I received a, a letter similar to that from a very famous um, Adventist ministry. And they were working in South America, and they were working in one of those areas that was a bit of a war zone, and they were asking us to help sponsor a kid to school because young men who were found not in school were being abducted and then forced to fight in the guerrilla warfare. Now, I read the letter, and I thought to myself, you know, they really could have done a better job of writing the letter. I mean, sometimes these letters can seem a little insincere, and the skeptic in me, the critic in me, looked at the letter and said, yeah, sure, you want me to pray, but really what you're after is my money. And that's what I used to think until I went on a mission trip. And let me tell you, when they ask you to pray, they mean it. Think about this for a moment. If you're working in an area to spread the gospel in a place where they're abducting kids and, and forcing them to fight in a war, then you're preaching the gospel in a place where you can get shot. Some of our brightest and best are spreading the gospel in places that are downright hostile to Christianity. Some of you come from places where you understand how dangerous it can be. The water the food, the bugs, the animals, the governments, all these things can be dangerous. There are parts of the world where you can be persecuted, tortured, and put to death by militias, terrorists, governments, um, radical uh, religious extremists. There are so many dangers out there when you go to preach the gospel in many parts of the world. And when they ask us to pray, they mean it. A friend of mine was telling me a story. He's a pastor, by the way, and a group of his family and friends were going over to India to actually conduct an evangelistic series. And before, one of the members of the group actually happened to be his mom. And before she left for India, she came to her son and said, son, would you please pray for me every day? Now, he's a pastor, and this is his mom. What's he going to say? So he said, of course, mom, I'll pray for you every day. Well, shortly after that, mom and the group flew over to India. Anybody here ever have the Holy Spirit wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you you need to pray? Anybody ever had that experience? It's powerful, isn't it, when it happens? Well, my friend was woken early in the morning, and he just had this sense, this sense of urgency that he needed to pray for his mom. So he gets out of bed, gets on his knees, and he starts praying for his mom. He's praying for a full 15 minutes before the sense of urgency finally leaves. Well, then he gets up and he decides to go on with the rest of his day. A couple of weeks later, he's forgotten about that incident until his mom comes home and she begins to talk about her trip in India. One evening, they were in Bhopal, India, conducting an evangelistic series when a group of, of religious extremists showed up and they wanted to kill the speaker. So there they were with their homemade firebombs, and they were actually launching them at the speaker on the platform. And the bombs were actually going over the platform, and they were landing in the audience who were listening that night. One of the firebombs struck a woman in her head, and it killed her and the child she was holding. As my friend's mom was looking, one of those bombs came directly at her. It landed at her feet, rolled towards her, but fortunately it fizzled, and it died out. As she was sharing this story, my friend looks at her and he says, Mom, when did that happen? What day and at what time did that take place? Now understand that where my friend was living and where Bhopal, India is, it is exactly 12 hours apart. And his mom told him it was on this day and at this time. And he realized that was the exact day and time the Holy Spirit got him out of bed and told him, you need to pray for your mom and you need to pray now. Friends, that is the power of prayer. We have people in the world who are working in places where they need your prayers and the prayer of a righteous Christian accomplishes much. And if you want to be on the team and do your part, then all of us, something we can do is pray. 
So pray all you can. Now that's the first thing we can do. The second thing we can do is do all you can. And I just want to bring this Bible text to your attention. Now he, speaking of Jesus, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You see, we often forget that it's the little things in life that make the biggest changes. It's like Lauren said, you make a little change over here and it can produce a big change over there. And the way we grow the kingdom of God is I simply go up and I touch you. And I touch your life for Jesus. And then you touch somebody's life for Jesus. And they touch somebody's life for Jesus. And they touch somebody's life for Jesus. And what started out as a small act of kindness can turn into a major ministry halfway around the world. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a lady in India. She's a Christian, and she was working for a textile factory. They made silks, silk clothing, silk cloth. And her job was to receive orders, box them up, and then send them out to uh, basically around the world. And one day she was putting together this order, and the Holy Spirit put it in her heart to take a piece of literature and put it in this particular box. Now, it just so happened that she had one of those Bible tracts right there in her bag. So she digs in her bag, she pulls out the tract, she throws it in the box, she seals it up, and she ships it out to Burma. Little did she realize that this box was headed for a Burmese chief. Well, the chief received his box, and he looks inside to, to you know, receive his package, and he sees in there this piece of literature. And he opens it up, and he begins to read it, and it basically said to him, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he's looking at this, and he's going, well, who's Jesus? And, and he's, he's trying to figure out who they're talking about, and, and he wants to learn more, and he turned the tract over, and it said, basically, if you want to know more about Jesus, contact us at this address. And that's exactly what he did. He wrote a letter. He sent it off to some place like Redlands, California. Maybe you recognize that. And he said, please, I want to know more about Jesus. Would you send somebody to speak to me and my people? Well, missionaries were dispatched. And they went into this community. And they spoke to the chief and his tribe. And they shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and the three angels' message. And during that crusade... Some 1,500 people in his tribe gave their life to Jesus. That Burmese chief and 1,500 people were baptized, and then they started a church 1,500 people strong. And all because one person heard the Holy Spirit say, do this small thing, and it created a hurricane in another part of the world. And you see, that's all you have to do. Just do whatever little thing God has put before you. You don't have to be a Billy Graham. You don't have to be a Dwight Nelson. You don't have to be a Doug Batchelor. You don't have to do some big thing. Most of us are given a gift by God, an opportunity that is so small, and it turns out that it actually has the ability to do great things. And if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God and see it grow, if you want to be on the team, then pray all you can pray, and then do all that you can do. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is this. I want to make this recommendation. Give all you can. Deuteronomy 8.17 says this. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand have made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the power to make wealth. When it comes to missions, I want you to know that there are two kinds of people. Those who go and those who send. Now, all of us are not called to go. Not all of us are going to be evangelists. Not all of us are going to be missionaries. Which means if you don't go, then your job as a Christian is to send. And when you send people, you need to support them. Missions do not happen without resources. Evangelists and missionaries still need food, clothing, and shelter. 
It costs money to print Bibles and Bible studies. It costs money to send missionaries and evangelists and doctors and nurses halfway around the world. It costs money to build churches and hospitals and orphanages and medical centers and schools of evangelism. These things do not happen without our money, without our support. And if you're going to send, support them in the sending. Now, I understand God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the riches of the earth are his. But understand, if you're living in North America, then God has given you enough wealth to help his work and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, you're richer than you think. How many of you remember those commercials from Scotiabank, right? You're richer than you think. Folks, because of the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, if Jesus can take two small loaves and five fishes and feed 5,000, then imagine what he can do with your little contribution. But you see, so many of us have forgotten the power of the little things. And we fail to give because we think, well, what's a loony going to do, right? I mean, what can you do with a loony? We th often think I have to give hundreds or thousands of dollars in order to make a difference. But folks, I want to talk to you about the power of one. Just one little thing. When I was pastoring down in St. Catharines, I was asked to speak at the uh, what's known as the BME Church. It's the... Baptist Methodist Episcopalian Church. Now, that's a mouthful. I'm so glad we're Seventh-day Adventists. That's a little easier to pronounce. Well, I was asked to speak there, and I was asked to give a tribute. It was Black History Month, and I was there to give a tribute to Harriet Tubman. And if you have no idea who that Christian lady is, let me tell you something. She was a force. It was an honor to research this lady's life. She was a Christian, and she was one of those people who worked in the Underground Railway freeing slaves. I mean, this, this little lady, she was just a force to be reckoned with. But before I got up to speak, there was a lady there from um, an organization known as Community Care. And she wanted to talk about the power of one. Not one million, not 1,000 or 100, not even the power of one dollar. She wanted to talk about the power of one penny. You see, her organization wanted to raise money for a local food bank that they were partners with. And they said, now how can we go about this? And, and, and they decided on putting out a jar. And on the jar, they simply put this, this little sign. All we're asking you to give is one penny. Not a dollar, not ten dollars. We're just asking you to give one penny. Six months later, they raised six thousand dollars. Folks, that is the power of one. It's not the big things that change the world, it's the little. And I want you to understand, God is asking you to do the little things so that he can do his big thing, but he can't do his big thing if you won't do the little thing God has put right in front of you. And if you want to be on the team and a part of the kingdom of God, then go out and just do something small for somebody else and just watch what it will do for the gospel. I want to end with this one thought, this one story. There is a pastor named Paul Yonggi Cho. He is the pastor of the largest Protestant church in the known world. It's over in South Korea. It's called the Full Gospel Chapel. And uh, one day, now one day, over a course of a month or so, Pastor Cho had just read this book. It's a little red book. Little red books sound familiar to you as Adventists? It was entitled Evangelism. Guess who wrote it? Ellen G. White. And so Pastor Cho had finished reading Evangelism by Ellen G. White, and after he put it down, he decided that this is how the butterfly effect would work in his church. He went to his members, all four of them, and said, this is how we're going to grow the kingdom. I want you to go out. I want you to walk through your neighborhood and your community. I want you to go about your daily lives, but I want you to keep an eye out for somebody to help. There's always going to be somebody you can help. Maybe they need help with groceries. Maybe you can help with dishes. Maybe you can watch somebody's kid. But he said, keep your eye out for people you can help. And ask nothing in return. Just help. And then he taught them. Eventually, those people are going to look at you and say, why are you helping me? I don't know you. I, I can't pay you. Why, why are you helping me? 
And then he taught them to say this. I'm a Christian. And I saw that you were in need. And it dawned on me that if Jesus were here, Jesus would have helped you. So I'm just doing what Jesus would have done if Jesus were here. His church started out with four people. In the first year, they grew to 50. In four years, they grew to almost 600. Today, their church is the largest at, eight, at over 800,000 members. They hold worship services every day of the week. And if you want to get a seat at church, you need to show up an hour early. That, my friends, brothers and sisters, is the power of the butterfly effect. Jesus said the gospel of this kingdom would start out as small as a mustard seed. That means it's going to start out with one of you, just one of us here, and we're going to touch a life. And we're going to touch a life. And we're going to touch a life. And we're going to grow the kingdom of Jesus Christ until every single people, tribe, and nation has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can do that in our lifetime. And all you've got to do is just be on the team and do your part. And if you would just pray all that you can pray. If you would just do all that you could do and give just what you can give, then understand it's going to start out as a whisper, and it's going to end as a roar. And then Jesus said, then, and only then, the end will come. Amen? Amen. Thank you.